Well, good afternoon and welcome to H360 Live. My name is Dave Duplay and joining me here in the studio this afternoon, as always, is my friend and colleague from Healthy O360, Miss Cortland Long. Well, Cortland, good to see you. Good to see you, Dave. How are you? I'm doing great. What about the snow we got last night? I know. Well, we knew we were going to get one big storm. We get one every year, and I think that was it. Absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. Cortland, you know, a lot of our viewers, the last time they saw you on the show, you had a full head of hair. <laughs> yeah. uh, you told everybody at home that you cut your hair and you donated mm -hmm. it, which you did. Mm -hmm. And the reason we now want everybody to know why you did that is because you're going through the battle of breast cancer. I am. I'm in the club. You're, yeah. in, the, <laughs> you're, you're in the club. Well, yeah. you've got a great shaped head. Thank so, you. you know, I can't think of anybody that's got a better head than you do right Maybe now. Maybe Mr. Clean. I don't know. Well, I don't know. <laughs> you, know you do need a shave. I didn't ah. want to bring it up, but, uh, you know, since we're going live. It's we, hard to see in the back of the head. It, it is really hard to see. So yesterday you were in the chemo chair for your third time? Mm-hmm. Three out of eight. Three out of eight. And tell me a little bit how what happens when you go, you're being treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Yes, I am. Great institution. They're very good. Tell me what happens when you show up there on chemo day. So on chemo day, I go in, I get a quick blood check. They just do a little finger prick. It's not an, IV, uh, not an IV or anything like that. And they're checking mainly my white blood cell count to make sure it's still high enough to go through the chemo. And then um, I have a meeting with my oncologist and we talk about how it's progressing and she checks my tumor to see if it's shrunk at all. And then after that appointment, the pharmacy actually starts to mix my chemos. And um, then I have about a two hour infusion in the chair and that's just a regular IV. I don't have a port or anything like that. And it's just boring more than anything. Well, <laughs> I hope you take your iPad and watch yeah. a movie or well, something. Well, I read, I read books, yeah. You read books. Well, mm -hmm. great. Well, you know, we've got a great show because today, Valentine's Day show, yeah. and I'm so excited about this because we want to talk about relationships. We want to talk mm -hmm. about love, and we want to talk about relationships particularly as they pertain to chronic illness mm -hmm. yeah. and specifically um, rheumatoid arthritis. It's a big topic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can't wait because we're going to have uh, Dr. Logan uh, Kev? Levkoff. Levkoff. <laughs> Levkoff. I knew I would mess it up. And Era Dracranian in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, and they know an awful lot about this topic, yes. right? Dr. Logan is an expert in relationships and sexuality, and Dr. Era is a rheuma, uh, rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. So you put those two together, and they're going to have a lot to say to educate us today. Um, so I can't wait to get started, but before we do, I have a couple of statistics I'd like to go through with our home audience just to kind of set the stage. What do you say? I think that's great. Okay. Well, here we go. Number one, a young couple marrying for the first time today has a lifetime divorce risk of about 40%. That is a really, really big number. The good news is since 1980, that number is going down consistently, so there is some positives in that. Some studies indicate that 75% of couples dealing with a chronic illness end in divorce. That's what we're here to talk about today. You're going to hear some helpful tips on how to get through that. A 2009 study showed that a woman diagnosed with a serious disease is six times more likely to be divorced or separated than a man with a similar diagnosis. Not such good news for the men out there. The divorce rate of RA patients is reported to be 70% higher than that of the general population. So that's why we're here today. We want to talk about this. We want to bring it from the back room to the front room, and so I say we get started. You know, it's so important to talk about what's going on in your life, especially as it pertains to chronic illnesses. So, Doctors Levkoff and Dickranian, thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, we think this is such an important topic of discussion. Um, very, there are very few resources out there for individuals with chronic conditions as they pertain to their relationships, especially for those with RA. And we have a large uh, membership base in our community of those living with RA and since it's Valentine's Day we think that your advice is going to be even more pertinent. Um, so can we start out by having you both kind of share with us a little bit about your lives and your professional studies? Certainly I'm happy to start. So I've been a, a rheumatologist for the past 16 years in the San Diego area and uh, what attracted me to, to rheumatology or one of the main reasons was the resilience that I found in patients who were dealing with chronic disease and, and, and usually with arthritis, in that uh, rather than giving into the deformities or handicaps that arthritis can produce, 
uh, patients found ways to adapt um, and to try and live as normal life as possible, albeit sometimes with assistive devices and such. Um, and what's, what's motivated me since that training time, uh, 16 years ago, is the advent of some newer therapies that really have made a big dent in being able to control rheumatoid arthritis, as well as, uh, in certain cases, achieve remission. So it's been remarkable to see the progress and how uh, research in basic science and the pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis has translated into effective therapies that, uh, in most cases, can um, improve the lives of patients living with rheumatoid arthritis. I am an educator in the space of sexuality and relationships and have been since I was 15, so <laughs> 25 years. Uh, but you know, my, my passion for this work really came from this understanding that sexuality was such a big part of who we all are. Um, and no one ever really spoke candidly or openly about it. But, but the impact of not talking about sexuality and health in that respect creeped into every other aspect of our life. So I think I've spent the last few years uh, creating a space where people really feel comfortable taking ownership of their bodies and their sexuality so that we can make good decisions for us regardless of our relationship status. Um, and, and for the last year or so, um, R and I have been privileged to partner with Pfizer on this new website, arthritis.com, with the idea being that we've talked to a lot of people who are working through RA and other chronic illnesses, and their sexual and intimate lives and their relationships is this area that we really don't talk about, just mm -hmm. to your point, Cortland, that we don't really discuss it enough, and it does impact our health now as well as moving forward. Yeah, so relationships are stressful chronic illness is stressful, when you put that into the same pot and mix it up, what are some of the things that, you know, if you're, if you're the patient and your spouse is the caregiver, what are some of the things that both the patient and the caregiver need to look out for to maybe mitigate some of the down the road negative things that can happen in a relationship with a chronically ill and specifically RA patient and their caregiver or their their significant other? I think that's a really important question to ask because as our relationships evolve, the roles that we play in them do evolve. And sometimes people really like the caregiver role and ideally in a good relationship, we both give care to one another and maybe it's just in different ways. But there is you know, a risk that someone who becomes the caregiver, it changes the power dynamics in a relationship and, and someone might feel like some of their equity has been lost. So it's really important for us to acknowledge and talk through some of these challenges as they emerge so that they don't become these huge issues so that when someone feels like their role has shifted in a way that they're not comfortable with, we, we take ownership of it right away, we acknowledge it so that we can find other support systems so that the, the, the balance doesn't have to shift so greatly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from the clinical side? Yeah, it, it's very important to acknowledge that education for both the patient and their significant other or family or whatever the support network the patient chooses to have uh, is critical, really. Uh, not just an understanding why someone gets rheumatoid arthritis or why certain therapies are instituted, but why patients don't necessarily feel back to normal even despite that therapy. So we have um, well-documented cases and examples and series and data that show that even when we use therapies and bring the disease to remission or close to remission, patients still have complaints about chronic pain and fatigue. And for someone who doesn't know, who's maybe living with that person, uh, they don't understand if someone can't do a certain activity or isn't up for socializing or isn't able to engage in the activities that made them happy to begin with. So without that understanding and that perspective, uh, you've already got some tension in that relationship. So from a clinical aspect, it's important that patients bring whoever the, that support network is to visits to help understand, to provide them literature um, and, and to talk, whether it's to a clinician, whether it's to other allied healthcare providers or to support networks to help um, maintain that perspective and not sort of think of the patient as just making up symptoms just to get out of certain things because that's certainly not the intention in, in almost all cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like a big thing we're talking about here are lines of communication and relationships can suffer greatly without open communication and problem solving but I imagine there's kind of like a sweet spot for every relationship. Everyone's different in how they deal with things. 
So how can a couple kind of know if they're talking too much or mm -hmm. too little about the chronic condition and the stress that it's putting on the relationship? Communication is not a novel relationship tip, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we use it, we, we talk about it every single day. It's not new. People roll their eyes, oh, that again. But there's a reason why we talk about it because, you know, we're not mind readers. Mm -hmm. Whether you've been with someone for a day, a week, or even 20 years, you can't anticipate what someone else is feeling, especially if they're experiencing a chronic health issue that you can't see from the outside. We just don't know, which is why it's so important. I think that good communication revolves around being accountable, owning where you are in your feelings. So something even as simple as, as speaking from the I as opposed to finger wagging and you, mm -hmm. um, as well as being a good listener and, and really not making assumptions about what we think our partners are going to say and listening and, and leaving the door open for someone else to voice their concerns too, uh, because it is tough. And I think that we need to create a space where if someone says, you know, it, it's too much that they feel safe saying that mm -hmm. and that their partner doesn't, you know, recoil at that and, and feel um, taken aback. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the individual needs of every patient are different and those needs may evolve over time. So some patients want to know everything about their disease and different treatment options and others just take a very passive role and say, whatever you say, doc. Uh, and, and that works for some cases. It, I think the more active a role a patient takes in his or her own disease management, the better the outcomes are. And usually that involves not dealing with the patient as a vacuum, but also within the support network that they bring in. So, uh, you know, some common language that, that I think exemplifies this is, you know, often we refer um, to patients as the RA patient, or you know, you're a patient with RA, and we often forget that that's that's actually a misnomer. It's actually a person who's living with rheumatoid arthritis, and just those semantics make a big difference because rheumatoid arthritis, especially maybe early on, is a big part of someone's life. It affects them. And there's large changes in, in someone's um, outlook on life, but ultimately the person still has. Um, work and employment and family raising and activities and relationships to deal with and we can't just assume that RA is the overwhelming and predominant feature of this person's life story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about outcomes, it's a, it's a great topic because we hear all the time from people who come in and whether they're cancer patients or RA patients that positivity is really key in going through the journey with somebody. And so, as you point out, you've got some patients that come in and say, well, doc, whatever you say, I'll take this pill or I'll do this thing or I'll go to you know, physical therapy. And then you have others that are out there really taking a more active role. How does the significant other, what, ha what happens when there's an imbalance, say? The patient, the person living with RA, is on the internet trying to find as much information trying to be as positive, but that other person in the relationship is not quite there. Do you see outcomes having a, a you know, that playing in, in the whole outcomes equation as well? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the discrepancy between uh, people's outlook on, on the same disease, I think, is well recognized really in any phenomenon. And in, in early cases, um, there might be a period of denial on the part of the patient and or the family member who just doesn't want to either believe or face the fact that we're gonna be dealing with a chronic illness and it's really gonna change the aspirations and dreams that the person and or the couple or the family have had. Uh, but it's important to engage in that discussion and that's really where education comes in and where, where there's a potential conflict that's gonna exist there. I think it's really important to engage not necessarily a rheumatologist who in 10 or 15 minutes isn't going to be able to do much, but to find that support network or, or the advocacy group or the mental health care professional or the therapist to help in that regard and to be proactive about that rather than wait for problems to set in after the fact. You know, you hit on another good point, education. And, you know, the Internet is a very powerful tool, but we hear from patients it can be a very scary tool because there's a lot of bad information. Just as there's good information from credible sources on the internet, there's bad information. And I, I have to tell you, in preparing for the show, I did go out to the internet and I Googled sexuality and relationships. And boy, I gotta tell you, I got my eyes full of all kinds of things out there. So I could just imagine what you're saying, but 
um, you know, what you're talking about in terms of education, but when you sit down with a patient and you guys have come together in this collaboration with Pfizer, which I think is just phenomenal, how do you begin to broach that subject of education and open communication, sitting there with the patient and with their, their loved one? I think there's something very valuable in letting a patient and their partner, whomever their support system is, talk about what, what they would like the other person to do, what role they would like to play. So maybe someone is going to do all the research. Maybe it's not the person living with RA because maybe that's a lot to take in. Maybe it isn't. But you sort of have the opportunity to delineate roles mm -hmm. so that you know what's expected of you. I think oftentimes, and, and Ara alluded to it before, that you know sometimes it feels like the person who doesn't have RA um, takes a back seat. But it's not always because someone is, in, is disinterested. Sometimes it's because they, we don't know how to help you. And it's, it, that's a tough conversation to have, but it needs to be said. How can I be there for you? Or what kind of language could we, could we create so that when things get tough, maybe you don't want to tell me everything, but can we develop some kind of code language that says, I'm okay, but I'm struggling right now. But maybe I don't want to give all the specific language. Mm -hmm. um, and that's th those are really complicated conversations to have, but I think they make the, the, the treatment process a lot, a lot more manageable. So we started to touch a little bit on the topic of isolation and using social connections and support groups and everything to help with that. And I know isolation can be a big part of people living with chronic conditions, especially ones that have pain and fatigue associated with them. So for a couple that's going down the road of RA together, how can they use their social connections, support groups, or their friend groups that are already there in their lives to help combat isolation? Well, that is one of the best things about the internet, is that even though there is good, bad, and ugly information out there at times, there also is a great way of, of connecting to people who are going through the same experience that you are. Um, ideally, people are in your community, maybe that you know, but if you don't, you have the opportunity to build a different network and to be able to share and maybe talk through what has helped you or your partner. Um, and, and create an, an alliance and, a, and another family, right? Family is not just the family we were born with, it's the families we create. Yeah. So financial stress, right? You, we're, we're talking about the emotional component here and the physical component. But let's face it, you know, when somebody's going through a chronic illness, the financial strain on the relationship is great. What are some of the things that you recommend the couple do to, you know, get that on the table and, and work through those issues? So they don't really exacerbate into what ends up being separation or divorce. Yeah, well, one, one of the key reasons people get into those financial difficulties is because of just the anxiety about no, no, not knowing what's going to come in the future. So people go from fully functioning normal people to now having a disease where their employment is in jeopardy, their ability to take care of families in jeopardy, uh, health care costs rise because of frequent office visits and lab tests and x-rays and expensive medications which may or may not be covered by insurance. Um, so those are all anxieties that, that unless talked about they're going to create some strain because of just finances. And so uh, very often large academic centers and rheumatology clinics or any clinic dealing with chronic disease will have social workers employed to help in that regard. Um, people sometimes consider temporary disability to sort of get their uh, health back in status and that might help in other words reduce workloads uh, will often help as well to help patients manage their symptoms in a productive environment as well. Um, but that gets the conversation started and then obviously again that support group comes up as an important factor to to help patients navigate through what well, what are my options if I'm not going to be able to uh, make as much of a contribution financially in this relationship as I need to. Yeah. But content is important too, what we talk to our partners about. So absolutely we should be talking to our partners about where we are health-wise, but that can't be the only thing we talk about. We can't only talk about financial stress. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. because then it becomes something so much bigger and it colors everything we do. You know, we need to find positive, meaningful, intimate connections outside of that um, so that there is a balance. So that you, you find the strength to, to navigate through the tough conversations because you have a lot of good ones too. Right. And that's sometimes, that's sometimes hard to do when you're, when you're in it. Yeah, it definitely is. 
So taking the conversation on now the more positive <laughs> bend, um, how are some ways that you guys have seen chronic illnesses actually strengthen relationships? Yeah, that's a very good question. And very often um, we don't get a chance to see that as much as it actually happens. Again, because um, patients are coming in by themselves or, or they might bring in their significant other um, sporadically. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, the ability to care for someone or to get through hard times um, in any situation is going to strengthen a relationship. And again, the outcomes that has on not just rheumatoid arthritis, but in a lot of the comorbidities such as anxiety and depression is great, is wonderful. And so uh, I think one translates very directly into the other uh, very often, but I, uh, I, I'm not aware of a lot of data that, that shows that, that, uh, that that's beneficial. In other words, you know, good healthy outlooks, good healthy disease control is good for relationships per se, the information is lacking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and if they're good for the individual, in, in essence, they're, they're, they're good for the, the people sure. who surround them, who they're surrounded by. But connection with the people in our lives is really important. Affection. Um, one of the things that I think we sometimes don't do a great job with is this the idea of sex is more than just one behavior. You know, for a lot of people with RA or any other chronic illness, one particular act of sex may not be something that someone is ready or can physically engage in right now, but it's all of the other connection. It's the kissing, it's the talking, it's all of the other intimate connections that sometimes are very underrated, um, but are really meaningful and really bring partners back together. Mm -hmm. When you counsel couples, let's say a couple with minus the chronic illness. What can those couples in your counseling learn from a model couple with the chronic illness? Do you, do you ever do any comparisons and contrasting of that? Not so much comparisons, but I think they're just some things that are really good for relationships. Obviously communication being one of them. But I think also um, redefining what sex and intimacy mean thinking really about the little things that, that tend to fall by the wayside um, you know, as a relationship evolves over time. And when I think about the routines that we get into, even something like kissing, after a long period of time, what happens to couples? You know, it's the obligatory peck on the cheek or on the lips, and there's really no other connection outside from that. There may be other you know, body part connection, but that, that first really affectionate reminder that you care about someone um, we don't do anymore. And, and it's really the little things that make us feel loved and cared for and set the stage for all of our positive interactions moving forward. Yeah. Um, well, depending on the circumstances, chronic illnesses can really prevent someone from feeling attractive or that they even want to engage in kissing and hugging. So, you know, how can a spouse help with this issue? The one thing we all need to remember is that no matter where we are, no matter how young or old we are, no matter what our health issue is, we have the right to meaningful, fulfilling, sexual, intimate relationships. That is our right, and also things do change over time. One of the, I think, our biggest challenges is that we have so bought into these fairy tales of how the, the trajectory our life was supposed to take, <laughs> and the likelihood is that it doesn't, the, the expectation does not match the reality. And it's not supposed to. And sometimes it's a matter of reframing it and thinking of all the other positive things. And it's, okay, so it didn't exactly work like how I expected. That doesn't mean I can't be fulfilled. But we're so used to putting everyone else's needs before our own. Um, sometimes it's time to think of us and self-love and, and the pleasure we get emotionally and physically from ourselves. And sometimes that's a really hard thing to do, but it, it it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if someone's symptoms like pain or stiffness are so overwhelming that uh, it, it just makes him or her not feel very attractive or certainly not very sexual, then that obviously needs to change. Either there needs to be a change in the treatment plan and or there's another comorbidity that needs addressing such as anxiety or depression um, or physical conditioning. Um, so I, I think recognizing those limitations and understanding if there's a basis upon which treatment can change and or how to work with those relationships. So many people with long-standing established arthritis really may not have the mobility of their joints to feel attractive or to be able to do 
the things, whether it's sexual or non-sexual, that they were able to do. But there are ways around it, as, as uh, Logan is suggesting. So uh, try, trying to tap into those resources that are really intrinsic and ways to find um, uh, comparable activities that might achieve the same goals or even enhance those goals, um, I think are what we, we should strive for. And I think we also forget that sexual health is really such a big part of our overall health. And sexual functioning is a part of our health. So those are absolutely things we need to be discussing with our medical providers as much as we do everything else because there are things that we can manage and there are obstacles that we can surpass, but we have to talk about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's different stages of relationships. So if you look at a couple who's been in a relationship for a long period of time and RA... I wouldn't imagine all of a sudden just comes on one day you wake up and boy your your joints are it maybe there's a progression to that so the the couple sees it's going along and so and then on the other side of the coin you have uh, a new relationship or a relationship that's just getting underway and depending on whether it's RA or some other chronic illness sometimes the side effects the pain the limps the the hair loss can be masked, can be hidden. Do you talk, if you take those two sides of the coin, do you, when you're working together in collaboration, do you treat both the same or do you talk to somebody comes and says, boy, I've, I've got RA and guess what, I just met the perfect <laughs> mate. How do I begin to broach the subject of RA and what this journey is going to look like versus Here's a 40-year married couple that has seen it come on and progress. How, how is that, when you work with these couples, how does that differ? I think there are challenges and opportunities with, with both examples you've given. Ideally, a couple who's been together for a very long time has developed this great bond of trust and intimacy, and it seems like the, the, maybe the safer of the two. But the truth is, if you have a partner that's not willing to change their roles in their relationship, then that could be problematic. And on, on the flip side, sometimes when you're starting a new relationship and you're seeing someone for the first time and everything else sort of clicks, that you, you find ways to navigate it because you see something bigger um, than simply someone's chronic illness. But there are no rules about when to tell and how to tell. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that everything that is a part of us is part of our story. You know, we aren't people we are today without all the experiences we've had leading up to this point. Uh, and the truth is, if someone responds really badly, it's a really good litmus test for a partner that you don't want to have anyway. Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And really testing out that relationship with just that education and where people might be in their disease process. You know, obviously early on when rheumatoid arthritis is just settling in, there's a lot of anxiety about what's going on. Uh, a lot of times there's a delaying diagnosis because people assume this is just a stressful life or a bad mattress or overactivity uh, and so that has to be processed and um, it, it doesn't happen from one day to the next that people all of a sudden are given an RA diagnosis and they come to terms with it obviously there's a period of time so the relationship in whatever stage that's in becomes a critical element on either it's going to be supportive and help the patient along or it's going to be working against the patient and I think it's really for each couple to determine where they are in that process and how much they're willing to partner with each other moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know chronic illnesses can make it difficult for people and couples to keep engagements. Um, I know personally starting my journey, I wasn't sure how the chemo would affect me and my fatigue or whatever. So I arranged for my friends to come over and have potluck dinners and things like that. So if I started feeling really tired, I was already home and then I could just kick everyone out and they wouldn't <laughs> be offended because they knew what was going on. So how can a couple sort of prepare for this, you know, maybe needing to cancel unexpectedly and make sure that the people in their lives aren't offended by this? It's a matter of talking about your story with the people who you really, you really care about. Mm -hmm. And those are the people who ideally you want to be your extended support system anyway. Right. Um, you know, if they don't respond in a positive way, I think that's a bigger sign about your relationship with them, and those are the people who you wouldn't necessarily want around for support anyway. But, mm -hmm. but again, it's, it's part of our story, um, and I think that we don't always give our friends and the people in our lives the opportunity to prove to us 
what an amazing source of strength they can be. So sometimes it's a matter of being vulnerable and sharing and, and telling people that maybe we wouldn't necessarily tell right away. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and we all appreciate that patients have good days and bad days. Even the best controlled patient who may very often be in remission may have flares of disease and that sort of lays them up for a couple of days or a few weeks. Uh, they might have a good day and, and think, oh, I need to get everything done that I didn't get done the past week because I'm having a good day. And then they pay the price the next couple of days where they have to rest in bed. So I, I think that comes from experience with pacing oneself to allow some extra time to figure out, for example, a patient, a patient once told me, I have to go to the movie theater early, earlier than I would otherwise to find a good seat where I can stretch my legs, be close to now so that I have to stand up middle of the movie. I'm able to do that without sort of having to trip over everyone because again, my mobility isn't quite intact. Uh, so those are the issues that people have to think of. They have to plan for weather changes and how much longer things are gonna take them. And again, that can be very rarely done just with the individual alone. It always helps to have a supportive partner and a network of friends to, to, to help navigate all that. Yeah. So speaking about support, what can somebody that wants to be an advocate for their partner living with a chronic illness such as RA, what can, what can they do? What are some, some baby steps they can begin to take tomorrow to become that advocate? I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, which, which is that the first step is to be present and be present at the appointment so that there is that medical professional telling you what you can expect and, and giving you and your partner the tools to move forward, how to be supportive, uh, giving a partner a heads up, these are the things that he or she might be experiencing, this is where you may be of assistance. Um, would, is that what you, would I, you have said that? I would have said exactly <laughs> that, and I would only add that rheumatoid arthritis isn't, um, it's not your diagnosis, this is our diagnosis. This is something that we both have to deal with or we all have to deal with because it just doesn't affect one person in a vacuum. It's gonna affect you know, that, that larger support network that the patient has. So we, we uh, and by we I mean the support network, can't think of this as your disease, this is our disease. Yeah. Mm. So couples that are living with a chronic condition are not quote unquote a normal couple. Um, sometimes this can bring about anxiety, stress, you know, what, what have you. How can a couple deal with those feelings of not being a normal couple? Mm. I have this visceral reaction to the word normal, mm -hmm. that there is n no such thing as normal and that normal for all of us evolves. I mean, if someone that we care about and love develops a chronic illness, then that's our normal, mm -hmm. right? And it may look different from the day before, but that's okay. And I think it's, it, when we live in a world where all of those words seem to count, mm -hmm. normal, sex, where, where we measure things in terms of statistics, I don't think it's always helpful for us. Yeah. Um, we change over time. And even if we're not the partner with the chronic illness, we don't stay the same either. We evolve, our health evolves, our bodies evolve, our needs evolve. No one stays the same. Mm -hmm. So it's a... Good relationships are always about balance and give and take and you know ideally there's there's balance in the end and sometimes the partner needs more than someone else mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and you know we always ask patients when they come in how are you feeling or how are you doing and the answer usually is I'm okay or things are good uh, and patients may not necessarily remember how badly they felt two three four weeks ago um, so we go through and we uh, in rheumatoid arthritis we uh, examine the joints and see how swollen they are, look at lab results, etc. And perhaps by all those objective measures, things are looking good, but a patient maybe is still having pain despite their disease being well controlled, or they might be having anxiety, or you just might see that look on your face. So it really is our responsibility as healthcare providers to ask more probing questions, to say, are, you know, what's, what's going on? Your mood seems a little bit off, or you're not sleeping well, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And maybe there you can sort of fish out some anxiety or depression, and maybe part of those issues have to do with relationships that may not be as healthy as they need to be. Uh, and if they're not, it really, you know, we have to identify that and either treat it or, or, or engage someone else to help, 
help us in that regard. Do you ask your patients to keep a pain journal, mood journal, anything like that? If they want to, certainly. Mm -hmm. Not everyone wants to focus on their symptoms from one day to the next. Yeah. In you know, well-controlled patients who aren't having a lot of issues, it may not be so important, but early on in the disease course, it's quite important because sometimes, again, they serve as reminders from one visit to the next, which may be spaced by one, two, or three months. Um, and the second is, uh, uh, we might take that into account as one of those characteristics that might make us change treatment if things aren't really going according to plan. Mm -hmm. Well, our time is almost up, but I want to hit on a couple last points. It is all about education, right? And that's why we're here. Tell me, and you know, I, I love Pfizer because they're a company, in my belief, that they go far beyond the pill of bringing wellness to people. Right? They're not just about a pill, they're about full wellness. And you talk to the people at Pfizer and you get that real quick. Dr. Ira Jacobs was here not long ago sitting in that very chair educating our community on what a biosimilar is and the importance of, of biosimilars and affordability mm -hmm. and accessibility to medications around the world. Tell me a little about your collaboration with Pfizer. What's going on? What can we expect? And, and how's it going? Yeah. So uh, I think Pfizer recognized um, a, a couple years ago that despite the many advances in therapy uh, in dealing with rheumatoid arthritis, there still was a disconnect between patient outcomes, patient satisfaction, uh, patients' overall assessment of their health, and the measures of disease activity that we as clinicians use. So trying to understand why that discrepancy occurred led to a lot of projects in terms of talking to patients and surveys being done sent to patients and healthcare providers. And through that, we understand that a lot of what's not being discussed has to do with a lack of appropriate communication. And even though in most circumstances people are satisfied with how they communicate, very often that lack of time and the lack of speaking the same language led to the discrepancies between my opinion of how your arthritis is doing and your own opinion of how arthritis is doing. So we applaud Pfizer for its commitment to really taking a more holistic view on, on the overall management of patients, the importance of developing a disease management plan, and also uh, providing the tools and resources necessary uh, through examples like uh, arthritis.com to at least help empower patients to navigate through some of these difficult to talk about subjects. Yeah, Dr. Logan, I'm going to give you the last word. All right. So as an educator, I was brought on to, to help create the arthritis.com platform for talking about the things that we all really need to, to discuss. Who are our support systems? How do we manage chronic illness on dates? How do we deal with pleasure? How do we talk to doctors? How do we manage issues of fertility? Um, to really be able to speak to patients in clear person-to-person -person terms, as opposed to simply you know, provider to patient. Um, it has really been a pleasure, and I've been given a lot of amazing opportunities to speak to people with RA and who are navigating other chronic illnesses. My very closest friend has RA and I, I see sort of how, how her life unfolds all of the time. So to have a platform, no matter how big or how small, to, to raise awareness of this issue and to really normalize it for people um, has really been quite an honor. Well, Docs, thank you so much for coming in. Great work, mm -hmm. great work with Pfizer. Um, keep us posted on how things are going. We'd love to have you back um, anytime you're in town. So thank you. Thank you for thank coming you in. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for tuning in, and I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this all possible. Remember, all of our episodes can be viewed on demand at healthio360.com, and our podcasts can be found in the iTunes Store. Cortland, what about our social media efforts? Well, we love social media, and we're all over Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest using the hashtag Real Stories when we post, and we'd greatly appreciate it if you would do the same. On behalf of Dave Duplay, myself, and our entire Healthy 360 family, we'd like to thank you again for joining us today and look forward to seeing you again next week. I never had so much love on my